Hello, <laughs> I'm Tara Brabazon and welcome to the Post 41. This is our New Year's vlog. Yay! And I've given it the title of Grit, Passion and Power. And you'll see why shortly because I have two guests that are going to rock your universe. But can I say, <laughs> 2022, 2022 has been an incredibly difficult year. I don't know about all of you, but I've spent most of the year sort of looking for the tunnel, let alone the light at the end of the tunnel. And so I thought at the beginning of our 2023, I would introduce two remarkable human beings to you, Catherine, Kate, and the wonderful Eunice. They are incredible human beings. I met them, I think I met Kate a year or two ago, but I've got to know them both incredibly well this year. And can I say to you, these two remarkable women that you're about to meet, they really have changed my life. They have changed my life. They've enlivened my days. And they've reminded me so strongly about why education matters and why every day, is precious. So they've changed my life and the next 30 minutes or so, I believe they're going to change yours. So good morning, very good morning, early morning, Kate and Eunice. Hi, Tara. Good morning. <laughs> oh, so Eunice doesn't even speak now. She's just so famous. She goes, hello, I'm here now. Um, <laughs> this question is of you both. And and can I say the secret thing is they nearly finished their PhD. The pair of them are within, we think, a week, maybe two weeks of submitting their doctorate. So it is quite an emotional and special time for me as well, because this post is going to be a real photograph of the time and everything we've shared and we've cried and we've laughed and we've become very, very good friends through this year. So I'm quite emotional and I just want to capture <coughs> remarkable women. Okay, now the first question is, I want you both, if we can, and Eunice, we'll start with you and then move to Kate. Eunice, can you start us off and talk about the pathway that brought you to a PhD? So, Eunice, how did you end up here? Well, it's been a very, very long and um, windy road to get here where I am now. And I never thought I would be here and I wouldn't be here without you. Honestly, it's amazing. Um, I, my history goes back sort of, you know, when I started nursing about over 40 years ago, um, specialising in operating theatre nursing and all, and then after many, many years specialising in that area, I had a break while I had my family. Um, we had three beautiful daughters, one after another. Um, and then a surprise package arrived, which was our son in 1989 and he was a bit more of a surprise than we anticipated and it certainly takes us on a path that uh, I could never have imagined but it certainly enriched my life um, that he came into it uh, and that of our whole family my husband uh, who's his best mate and um, and our three daughters who are just amazing women that have um uh, just love him to pieces and our son-in-law and now our three grandchildren I mean it just goes on and on and the love is just immense um when Adam was born it became obvious after a little while that um something wasn't quite right and he was diagnosed with down syndrome and then uh, shortly afterwards it became obvious he had an acute bowel obstruction and being a nurse, of course, I, that's the one thing I've found the hardest throughout his care has been separating, am I a nurse or am I a mother? Um, and you're a bit of both. And it's very hard to turn off the nurse when you have to deal with something. You have to switch on. You know what to do. You, you just get on with it. But you just want to be a mother. You just want to have someone looking after you and your child, um, which is what we do, uh, Kate and I do all the time, looking after our patients. Um, but what, what changed for me after Adam was born, the surgery occurred, the first surgery of many, many surgeries occurred when he was 13 days old, which was the day after our eldest daughter turned six. 
So life was pretty busy with a two, four and six year old and, and Adam who required major surgery. Um, after that surgery, which was defined as definitive surgery, this was it. Um, he was having this surgery in those days, it was done as a two stage procedure where they removed a section of bowel, formed a colostomy, and then when he got bigger and we had the right instrumentation to perform the surgery, the bowel would be joined. And that would be it. End of story. Fixed. Done. <laughs> well, it's been a very different story to that um, through many, many years. He's now 33. Um, he's over those years, many, many years, many hospitalizations. He's lost all of his large bowel um, and he's ended up with a permanent, permanent ileostomy. Um, but he's an absolute delight, absolute delight. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened and changed for me when he was little was how I struggled with the fact that, well, this was definitive surgery. This was supposed to be fixing things. And yet here we were back time and time again, back to the hospital, more operations, more procedures, more obstructions. Why? 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 And I found it difficult to work out why. The surgeons, bless them, did the best they could because mechanically they couldn't see anything that needed fixing other than what they kept fixing. Yes. So it got me thinking when Adam was a few years old, he thought, you know, if it's so difficult for me and I work in the system, how difficult is it for other people who have never had anything to do with hospitals, don't understand the system. So I started to ask a couple of friends who are people I'd become friends with in the hospital, other mothers who happened to be nurses, another nurse who, who was a specialised nurse in paediatric um, care and looked after these children, including Adam. We joined together and we decided we would share our combined knowledge and experience and we would have a little mother's group. <laughs> well, that little mother's group has turned into this huge <laughs> support organisation internationally that uh, is still going today, 33 years later. Um, but that is what has been the foundation of my thesis, bringing all these people together, these people who have just told the most incredible stories. A lot of children who are born with Hirschsprungs or in perforate anus, that's the other kind of congenital bowel disorder, they, they are fine. But there are a few that it doesn't, the surgery doesn't lead to the end result, which is total continence being able to be out in the world, in society, knowing that you're not gonna have an accident, you're not gonna be uncomfortable, you're not going to shun people away because they don't understand why, what, what's going on, you've had surgery, it's fixed now, so what's the problem? Um, so it started me then incorporating my experiences into my work, I gravitated towards paediatric um, theatre nursing. I was able to go and see parents before and after the operations, uh, talk to them from a mother's point of view. Um, the doctors dealt with the medical side of things, but I just gave them comfort that they were talking to someone who'd walked this path before. Um, and, uh, and then in education, I moved to working within universities, teaching nurses and also medical students. And I found they wanted to know, they wanted to understand. And I've even had surgeons and obstetricians ask me, tell me what it's like. We deliver these babies, we operate on these children, we send them home. And as a nurse, it's something I've learnt over the years we do that all the time. We do what we have to do in hospital. We send people on their way. We have no idea what life is like for them behind closed doors. Um, so that's what I'm hoping this thesis will 
bring is open up the door to the lives of others less fortunate than ours um, and hopefully improve the education and support for these families. And Eunice, that you can see, can I say to everyone watching this video, you can see why we love Eunice and we love Cape with a passion. So Eunice, that's an amazing career trajectory and pathway as a human, as much as a scholar, as much as a worker that's going to lead you into the PhD. And we'll talk about the actual PhD in a second. But Kate, tell us about your pathway into a PhD. What brought you here? You, probably. <laughs> no. um, but I, I do want to say why Eunice <laughs> and I are besties. We're besties for numerous reasons, but because I can understand a lot of what she would have gone through as a nurse mother with a baby because I'm pediatric trained. I trained in the 1960s in Sheffield in the UK. <laughs> I, uh, Come on. Yorkshire. Yeah. Uh, but I'm pediatric trained. I did kids nursing for a long time. So I saw lots of babies with imperfect anus down syndrome. Um, so I had, uh, even though I don't know what it's like to live with a baby like this, I had some understanding when I met Eunice. And we met in 2008. We started the Master of Health Law together at Sydney University. And we just clicked on that day. And it's like one of those friendships, your friends forever. But um, what I did... Uh, my training was hospital training in paediatrics in general, pure bedside, all at the bedside. There was no university training for nurses in those days, but I love my bedside nursing. But when I'd finished training and worked as a staff nurse for a year, I then migrated to Australia. I was a 10 pound pom. I didn't weigh 10 pounds. I paid 10 pounds to come out here. And um, I, for two years, I traveled with friends all around Australia. And when we were broke, we'd lob into a hospital, immediately get a job and a bed and fruit to eat. And all that, you can't get a job like that anymore, I don't think. Um, I was going to go back to the UK after two years, I thought. But then I, things changed and I married and I had four children and did not work for quite a while, but re-entered the workforce in a Sydney hospital emergency department, um, which I loved, but I was so out of touch. I hadn't nursed for 10 years and I was in an emergency department. I didn't know anything. It was scary stuff and quite, quite odd, actually. I should have done some retraining or updating or something, but I didn't know. But things changed for me when I was on duty one day and an assistant director of nursing came into the emergency department and I just happened to be on duty. And she said to a few of us, Sydney University Faculty of Nursing had put out an offer to hospital trained nurses who'd been nursing for many years would they like to upgrade, update, go and do a degree? And I thought, oh, I can do that. Um, and I did. I first of all uh, went to Sydney Uni Faculty of Nursing and I did a graduate diploma to just transition me in. And I was just, look, I didn't know how to use a fax machine. I didn't know how to use the library. I knew nothing. Um, but this certainly set me up on the way for my career and constant university um, study. So I went from doing a graduate diploma in clinical nursing to a master's degree in clinical nursing with a thesis entitled Assessment of Pressure Ulcer Risk and Guidelines for Prevention. Why I was interested in pressure ulcers at that stage, I had no idea, but it was in my head and it's been in my head ever since. Um, and then I was encouraged to do a PhD at the University of New South Wales, which doesn't have a faculty of nursing. It's all um, every other discipline, but not nursing. So I was a bit odd. 
<coughs> on, on the outer really. Um, and so I enrolled in a PhD. This is 20 years ago, <laughs> right? It's taken me 20 years to get to this final PhD. Yeah. Um, but at one of the panel interviews in that first year of, of study, um, I loved the study, but I was so overwhelmingly busy. And the panel said, look, you, you're, out, you're out of time. Will you have uh, accept a, a master of re research in public health? And I said, yep, I'll, I'll do that. So that's what I did. And then I backed off from uni for a while and continued working. Um, and um, so I was in and out of hospitals, going to the community, going to nursing homes, seeing lots of people patients with pressure ulcers, huge pressure ulcers. And it haunted me since that time. So I had a break from study and then I went back. Um, I tried again to do a PhD. I enrolled again in 2014. Um, by 2019, I had to leave that university. I simply, anyway, not, um, Things were difficult, but it all happens for a reason, doesn't it? Look, it, it does. It does, Kate, and you, you confirmed that reason. That, that's going to change people's lives, you know, because yes. the thesis, you know, people have a go and it doesn't work, and it's, and it's not about you. It's about the time and the project and the university and multiple factors. And, Kate, so often people blame themselves, don't they? I did, absolutely, and I think that's, that's entrenched in nurses. We were always blamed when things happened. So you keep doing it to yourself. But, so I left that university in 2019. And then I don't know how I met you, Tara. I remember somebody saying, you have to look at the PhD owls, the older wise learners. And I started reading what those people were doing on Facebook and I thought, oh, Hmm. Well, and then I contacted you, I think, and I said, what can I do? And, and, we, I, and we came up with the magic PPP plan that we're going to talk PPP. about. Yes. And I just go back to one other variable where you and Eunice met, though. You did another master's degree, particularly looking at, at health and law, and yes. that interests me incredibly. Could you just give us a little bit on that? Because I tell you, what, that might be my next master's degree, I think. What was that like? The best degree I have ever was, um, it was a Master of Health Law back at Sydney University. So I've done everything at Sydney University and the University of New South Wales, but of course now I'm at Flinders with you. But the Master of Health Law, um, you had to have as a nurse, had some related field. Uh, to be able to enrol. And in one of our first classes, the lecturer said, oh, I want you all to tell us why you're here, why you want to do this degree and a bit about yourself. <clears throat> and I said, look, I'm, I'm a nurse. I'm doing medical legal reports, but I have no training to do that. And I couldn't find anyone else in Australia who was doing it doing reports for the courts so um and i degree so that i can learn more learn about expert evidence and how to write properly and oh. how to interpret medical legal things and then at the other side of the class, this girl said, oh, I do the same thing. And I went, oh, OK. <laughs> and then at coffee, Eunice and I got together. <clears throat> we were both doing Medicare legal reports. We've been together ever since. We, we're like besties. We talk all the time. And 
But see, that's the, one of the reasons that I wanted to do the post with the pair of you as well, too. You're both incredibly interesting and fascinating in and of yourself. But for me, there's something incredibly moving about the friendship between any humans. But, you know, the friendship between men later on in life is a, is a beautiful and powerful thing for men. And the friendship for women later on in life can be so enlivening and important for us all kicking on and moving on in our lives which, of course, leads me back to the legendary Eunice. Uh, and, Eunice, let's talk about this thesis. Uh, both your theses are stunning, but they're very different, can I say. They're configured as different genres of a PhD. Yours is what we would call a traditional thesis, Eunice. So could you, you know, tell us about the thesis, mate? What's it on? Well, the thesis is, is really a combination of all my experiences um, since Adam was born, really. Um, it's drawing together my experiences as a nurse, um, as a mother, um, caring for a child with a disability, um, a particularly a disability that's hidden, um, but risks being exposed uh, when, when you're out in society, which, which is always on the back of your mind, you know, is something going to happen? Preparation is huge. So... The PhD brings together my nursing, my my being a mother, um, mm -hmm. and education as as his life has progressed. And what I'm hoping is that it will help people to understand more about people's lives and and realize that. You don't know what goes on behind closed doors until you really get to know someone and, and listen to them, really listen. Listen to the parents is a huge thing that is missing um, in, in a lot of our nursing and hospitals. Um, when, when a child's in pediatrics and they transition to adults, it's like one door has closed, which has been like a family, a beautiful a cohesive family where everybody, including the parents, are part of the part of the process. You move to adults, and well, no, it's all about the adult, and you as a parent have no place. It's it's really difficult. Um, so my my thesis started off many 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 years ago at a different university, and and I guess the big problem there was not so much anything, it wasn't a wrong thing, it was more, we were not aligned. The, the person who became my principal supervisor was a long time friend, we'd worked together, um, he was a pediatric surgeon, wonderful man, um, and we just gelled. We, he helped us setting up the support group. We, we'd had a long history together, but our paths were completely different. He did explain to me later that while I wanted to do uh, more sociology type of thing and understanding people, he was purely numbers, purely statistics. And that just wasn't going to do it for me. It wasn't going to give me the kind of PhD I wanted to do. Uh, but it, because of our friendship, it's a very difficult thing to speak up and say things are not right. Um, but when I did, and we, we remain friends today and he's supportive, um, that opened a whole new door. And I turned to you, Tara, uh, because I'd, I'd been, we'd been corresponding for many years via the owls, via, you know, messaging, things like that. But just in the end, I turned to you and I, you know, what, what can I, is there any way of salvaging this? And it's taken a completely different path. Um, this PhD is now is, you, you can't recognise the two, totally and utterly different. It's exactly what I wanted to do, um, but I didn't have the knowledge and the skills to bring it to fruition. It, it's thanks to you that this has happened. 
Eunice, you're, you're a bugger. That's not the case. It's not the case. It's a hundred percent. I feel like the good, the good witch in, in like the Wizard of Oz, you had it within you all the time. Um, but, but Eunice, you, Eunice, you, you really did. The, the thesis you had, you were very clear, I think, on what the thesis that you wanted. You were very clear. It was about community, community groups, respecting the individual walking through with an impairment or rolling through with an impairment, depending on the impairment. And and we simply brought back Goffman. We brought back Goffman in a powerful way to understand the value of these community support groups and citizenship in a different way, how good decisions are made by all parties. And it's one of the truly astounding theses I've ever read, moving Every time I read a chapter, I cry. Uh, the first time I read the work you were doing, and it's this beautiful thesis where the stories undulate in and out of the thesis, and it is some of the most powerful writing we'll ever see. And so please remember Eunice's name because we're submitting the thesis shortly, and I think this will be probably a published book by June next year. And trust me, you need, you need to read this book. In <coughs> And that's, that's the traditional thesis. Let's now move to the legend that is the lady in red, or it may be, <laughs> again, Kate, it might be that orange red that you wear. And that's that pink. That, are you, do you just do this to me? Are you doing this to upset me? <laughs> is that pink? Pink, yeah. Look, something's happened in my eyes, eh? Unbelievable. Because that sort of looks like, like fire engine red to me, but that... <laughs> That may be the nature of my, my camera in, in Palmerston North and outside of New Zealand. But, Kate, darling, we want to talk about your thesis because you had these, these goes with the more traditional mode of thesis. And during the last 20 years of your life, you have published very strongly in this area. Uh, you know, as the theses came and went and all the rest of it, you published research in this field. So you're now enrolled in a PhD by prior publication often called a PPP so yeah. very rare only about two to five percent of theses are of that form uh, and they're particularly from medicine law and occasionally in nursing so tell us about your thesis in a PPP form and what you think about the PPP um, I'm loving doing the PPP uh, but be before I met you I had three masters but not encouraged me to get more publications um, for the PPP. So it's a, a PhD by prior publication is uh, developed through a lifetime of research, which I feel that I've been doing this for a lifetime. And it requires an understanding of the researcher, that's me. Um, and it, that's conveyed in my story, in my thesis. It requires the presentation of years of publications, how they cluster and how they make a We use that term throughout the thesis, significant original contribution to knowledge, because every, every paper I wrote and you had me so fired up to get more publications done that I actually came to you with 11 peer reviewed publications for the, this particular thesis. And it, it just helped me learn more and more and more about uh, pressure ulcers in hospitals, the community and residential aged care facilities. And I've worked in all of those areas of healthcare. So I feel that I've got an enormous understanding of what goes on. Um, so all the publications for a PPP have to be linked and you have to be able to describe how they've linked and how they've grown together and how they take you from publication number one all the way through to the end. So, um, I mean, I think I've been, I've been very, very lucky uh, to have met you to do all the publications that I've done and now this enormous thesis where people can read 
each of the 11 publications as they're reading through the thesis. Um, and nothing is ever lost, you know, because if I had graduated with a PhD 20 years ago, I would not know what I know now. And for people who think, oh, you're too old, you shouldn't be at uni. Um, many people think that. Yeah. No, because I'm 75 now. So I've been nursing since 1965, which is a long time. Um, but the, the knowledge I've amassed and the experiences are outrageous. I would not, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't failed those initial two PhDs. Well, I didn't fail, I just didn't finish. <laughs> I was about to correct you. you. They were not failures, they were simply that research stopped at yes, that. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah, it stopped. But I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed writing. And I think for older people who want to do a PhD, who want to link in with you and others, the PhD owls have been wonderful for me. I love reading what they <laughs> write and a bit of swearing and a bit of, yeah, and then seeing them graduate oh. and seeing the photograph. Everybody, if they think that morning and go, I have to write. For me, writing is like breathing. I can't go a day without writing. It's, it's really odd. It's like, water in a desert I have to write and I think even after I finish this PPP which is now finished and it'll come to you in the next 24 hours I hope um don't ever think you're too old because the amount of experience you amass in 75 years and I know you've got students my age and older I and I can I mean, we see them graduate from time to time on television, don't we? You know, the 90-year-old, the 80-year-old. Um, and I will, I will keep writing because I can't, I can't imagine a life. My um, knowledge and experience with pressure ulcers is in my medical legal career as well i have done so many medical legal reports on pressure ulcers pressure ulcers are foreseeable and preventable they're very easy to prevent one of my latest papers um, i was fortunate enough to work in uh, an, a residential aged care facility where it was full of pressure ulcers they all are but by the end of our research, which is published, the facility was pressure ulcer free. My goodness. Pressure yeah. ulcer free. And I can do that. I can help any aged care facility, any hospital, if they would like me to, so like to read the papers. Um, That's amazing. And because, so, Kate, that thesis, that thesis is going to be out once it's through examination and yes. examined very yeah. well it will be available publicly and yes. it will keep publishing in this area yes so the medical legal reports you know you might have somebody who's fairly normal walking into hospital for surgery elective surgery they end up with a heel pressure ulcer that requires a baloney amputation not on or they get a sacral pressure ulcer, osteomyelitis, and they die from sepsis. Yes. Yes. And because themselves is at risk of pressure ulcers, mm. but once they develop pressure ulcers, most elderly in nursing homes die with pressure ulcers. They don't heal. You can't heal them up. They're shocking. And the pain is outrageous. So, but we can stop them overnight, tomorrow. Anyone who wants some help with this, let me help you. 
Kate is Kate is your woman, and and Kate North Thesis stands for that. It stands for the rights of a human being, whatever age they may be, whatever impairment they may have, if, if dementia, if there are dementia variables there, yes. they are there is still personhood there. There are still rights there, and your thesis powerfully. Hard to see uh, a frail aged person in pain. It, I mean, I've cried a million times seeing them, and even thinking about some of them, I tear up. And and but Kate, you, your life and career has stood for something, and this thesis stands for something. So it's an incredible, incredible experience. Oh. I'm so I'm so glad we've shared this time. But let, let's go back to the, the Eunice journey a little bit if we can. Eunice, you, you how do I present this in a classy fashion because I'm classy? Uh, Eunice, your thesis has taken a bit of time uh, to get to this juncture. Could you talk to us a little bit about what went right and what do you think went wrong in that process? Well, what has gone right in that process has been the passage of time. And time has given me <clears throat> so much more experience that I would never have had. Um, uh, like Kate, if I tried to write this, you know, 10, 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't know what I know now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the experiences I've gained from listening to so many other people who have gone through what we've gone through. And initially, um, initially you feel like you're the only person with this problem. And that's exactly how, how the whole support group came about, was me writing to the Downs Association, Down Syndrome Association in New South Wales, asking them, could they put me in touch with somebody else who has this combination? This, their child has this combination. They said, "Oh, no, we don't keep, we don't include that in our data packs." And I said, well, "Why not? Why you should." Anyway, I, I don't know if they do now, um, but my letter did get published in their newsletter, and that then brought down, I think, about twenty-seven responses from other parents across Australia who said, "Oh my goodness." We thought we were the only ones dealing with this. We didn't know there was anybody else out there. And that started the support group. Um, <clears throat> the, they are the things that went right. All these little incidences that came together to make it possible. The thesis wouldn't be possible without all these stories. Wow. Um, I've had the most remarkable opportunities to speak internationally at um, conferences overseas. And that's thanks to my initial um, principal supervisor, pediatric surgeon. Uh, I wouldn't have had that opportunity without him and I'm very grateful uh, for that. <clears throat> I did feel very much like a fish out of water though, because those conferences were for paediatric surgeons um, talking about the medical care, the new advances in surgery, those kind of things. And it was one young um, surgeon who came up to me after one of the talks, I think in Milan, and he said, you, you look at everybody else who's up there talking. They're talking about their research, the latest instrumentation, the latest surgical technique, whatever, but no one has told us what you've just told us. We have no idea what goes on when we send these people home. We, we operate on these children, send them home, and then when they come back because there's a problem, we don't know what to do. We can't help them because while we're able to save these children's lives, that, that's been a huge benefit um, because really a few years before Adam was born, he probably wouldn't have been offered surgery because it was considered too difficult. Yes. So now we have been able to offer this surgery and that's wonderful, but we don't know what, what to do with the social side of things. Um, and that's what needs to change. So 
the, the benefits have been immense to me um, and I hope to other families. What has gone wrong is my, my fear of speaking up, recognising that I do have a voice as a student because for a very long time I saw myself as the, the student and the supervisors up here. Yeah. So whatever they said I had to do because they knew they were all knowing. I, I really was very naive. My pathway to a PhD was not your traditional um, and pathway that a lot of young people go into a PhD. There's different reasons people do it. Um, some people, they have to do a PhD um, because of a career trajectory, be it at university or, or whatever. But that, that's fine. But often they, they are told, look around the university, see who's offering supervision, find a, a, a subject that interests you, and, and so they tick a box and, and do a PhD in that subject. And they might never return to that area at all. Um, whereas when you're this age, and as Kate has said, she's 75, I'm 70, I, I would never, ever have imagined doing what I'm doing now, never. Um, but my reason for doing a PhD is not for a career path. I don't need a career path. Kate and I both, both work full time. We have our families, our lives are full. I don't need a career path, um, but I do need to speak up and, and speak up for all these families that, that are hidden behind closed doors. That is so extraordinary. Eunice, one of the most amazing definitions I've, I've seen about what is a human, what makes a human a human. Human beings are meaning makers. We move through life making meaning. And the idea that supposedly, you know, that meaning stops when we're 22 or 25 or 30 is simply nonsense because, in fact, we know more, we learn more, we are able to gather more meaning as we age which of course leads to my next question, and we might start with Kate and then go back to Eunice again, because look, I mean, I, my former job was as a, a Dean of Graduate Research, and I realised when I was in that job, something odd was happening. And what that was, was that the average starting age of students at uh, Flinders University is 40. And yet, if you look at all the iconography, the advertising, the material on scholarships and so forth, Whenever you think of a PhD student, you think of a 22-year-old young man often in a lab coat on scholarship. And yet that is a, um, they're one, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a physicist. These are my people. But can I say they're a very small group of what is the cohort of PhD students. And yet visually, they dominate the vista. So, Kate, why do you think all the focus is on, you know, the students in their 20s as such, and we're not visualising or understanding or seeing, like we're seeing today, our students in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. I have no idea, but a few years ago... It came around looking for people who would be prepared to be photographed to advertise the university students, you know, beautiful young students out on the grass, sipping coffee somewhere. And I wrote, can I be in the photograph? I'm really old. You don't know, no university advertises degrees, postgraduate degrees, PhDs for old people there's no old nanas and i've got seven grandchildren i can have all of mine holding my hand to Nana power. Nana power. Come on. yes but the other thing i must say um i it, it helps you to liaise with other disciplines and this is my next step what i've learned in the last couple of years is that um, when people are sleep deprived, in particular our oldies, it can 
be a, a contributing factor to dementias and Alzheimer's now. I never thought of that three years ago. Didn't, it didn't occur to me. And then I began to link what we as nurses do to prevent pressure ulcers. We reposition patients every two hours. Left so sleep deprived because they do get woken up. So um, you never, ever, ever get a night sleep. You never get a full night's sleep. You're sleep deprived for the rest of your life. And now I'm reading about sl what sleep scientists are writing about. Sleep deprivation can contribute to all cause dementias. I want to get together with these sleep scientists. Because the other thing is, people are not getting together. Disciplines don't get together. And, and Kate, people don't live long enough and don't work long enough to share how much they have learned. So yes, one of the great yes. gifts of being, I think, older and having the multiple careers that you've both had, that I've had, we've all had, is that, you know what, the weird thing is the the more more time you spend on the planet, the more you learn. Yeah, and absolutely. See? So as you said, you, you and Kate uh, are in full-time work. You're in full-time work. You have an inverted commas retired. So the knowledge generation will continue. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Y Eunice Darlin, what's your perspective on this? Because obviously, you know, you've got these three wonderful daughters and the extraordinary Adam. And how are you feeling now about so much focus being on students, particularly PhD students in their 20s, when that's such a small group of our students? I agree with, with what Kate said. Um, it's it's just not put forward as a possibility and and yet the possibilities are endless and what what we can possibly share surely has some benefit to somebody <clears throat> you know all through my life there's been little moments in time and are constantly being reminded that I didn't know that. I, I was sitting with my granddaughter on the floor the other night and she brought home her year's worth of work. She's in year four, bless her. And she was going through showing me the kinds of things she's learning today. I learned things that night sitting, listening to her. I said, oh my goodness, no one's ever explained that to me. I did. How do you do this? She's teaching me all the time. It's just incredible. Um, I can remember when I started nursing, the class was asked, you know, why do you want to be a nurse? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I can remember thinking, oh, I, can't, I can't wait. I can't wait until I finish this three years because then I'll know everything. <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. Now I know, oh my goodness, you know, here we are in our 70s. I haven't got enough time left. There is so much more I want to learn. I want to understand. Oh, it's so frustrating that we're on this planet for such a short time. But I, but um, I tell you what, Eunice, you've, you've, <laughs> you've used that time and we're sort of reaching the end of our conversation now and I'll punch on with you, as Eunice, if I can, about the surprises. So looking back, I'd say particularly what we've experienced, Eunice, because it's been such a, a revelatory year for me. I'll, I'll never forget. Every student is remarkable and memorable, but you two have really changed my life. You you two have, have really textured the clay of my personal and professional life. You've changed me. You've changed the shape of me. And I just wonder, in everything we've experienced, because it has been a successful candidature, what, what was the surprise? Was there a surprise there that you could share with somebody else? Gosh, the, the surprise is um, the amount of things that I had, <clears throat> that, that I thought I'd forgotten about and writing about them, it, it, it's just uncovered all these years of, knowledge and experience and emotion 
that I just had put away. Um, and through my previous experience writing a PhD, which was quite different, those, those sort of thoughts, emotions, personal stories were devalued. Maybe that's not the right word, but they were not encouraged to come to the fore because they weren't seen as important. And personal stories are what we all do. Everything, everybody has a story. Um, every single person. The, the homeless people I have taken students to to understand mental health in a completely different setting. Not in the hospital, in an acute setting where people are in a, an acute crisis. But when we send these people home and they live in the community, and mental health is not my thing at all, but I was asked to supervise students in this setting, I learned so much. Um, I, I think the surprise for me has been the story never ends. The and, story and never ends. It doesn't. And Eunice, we've been fortunate, I think, because during the period where we were prepping going into the thesis and doing it, the storying methodology has become quite large and quite well documented. And storying mm -hmm. with the new revisioning of Goffman has come together to create, I look, I'm getting emotional now because the thesis is so much like this, a thesis of texture and meaning and complexity and power. And that's because of everything you are. No other person on this planet except you could have written that thesis. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I sort of think all the parents who shared their stories with me, um, anyone could have written this, I feel. Um, it, it's just finding the right support and that's, you know, why we call you Queen Tara, because honestly, if, if it hadn't been for your support, and it took a long time during our process of writing this for me to feel comfortable exposing the personal side of things, because it was always repressed before as not you know, you can't do that. That's, it's not about you. It's not yeah. about a story, but it, that, that's what it's all about. That's the whole point of this whole thing. And, and I guess my one piece of advice to anyone considering a PhD is something I had never considered, interviewing your supervisor. Interview it. I was a mere student. I was just hoping somebody would take me on, not to interview them and consider if I thought they were suitable, if we were a match. That is so important. And for goodness sake, look for Tara's vlogs. Everything you need to write a PhD is there. Everything. Yeah. You yeah. are so generous in what you share. Um, and you've opened my eyes to ways of writing and expressing that I had no idea about. Yeah. Didn't know you could do it. The tragedy for me is you had that all the time, Eunice. All this writing power was within you all this time. And I'm laughing, Eunice, because obviously your PhD, Kansas, has lasted longer than most marriages, right? <laughs> and, and and get the, the notion of actually like interviewing a supervisor. It's like sort of picking up a random bloke at a bus stop and hoping for the best, right? There's a, <laughs> up a bus stop, that'll do, that'll be fine, it'll work well. And actually, it, it's a very close relationship. It's not intimate in the sexualized way, but it's it's the sharing of deep truths. Mm -hmm. it, it has a trust to it. I mean, I'd walk through broken glass with a pair of you, but it has a deep trust to it that unless you've had that experience, you don't know how these these relationships work. I could never have written what I've written without this deep experience mm -hmm. and, and and love of, of writing and and the fact that you embrace 
what I'm trying to say and um, and encourage it is just phenomenal. Um, and it really does take a village. I mean, you as the, the, the queen at the top, uh, helping me to write all of this and being able to be as open I have, as I have. Um, but it's also taken my family who, oh no, mum's busy, you know, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, and my husband, who just is the most wonderful man and is just takes everything in his stride, like, you know, the day that I finished the Master of Health Law and put a big smiley face on the calendar saying, that's it, never, ever going back to university, never again, that's it. Loved the Master of Health Law, it's been fabulous. A couple of weeks later, he, he just shook his head and, and <laughs> when I said, you know what, I, I think the only way to get people to understand what's going on, maybe, maybe I should do a PhD. <laughs> and he just thought, here we go again. <laughs> he, he, he's a, he's and he's still there. He's, he's just a legend. And, and, and Jamie and he will have a, a little cheeky verb on the side when we go to your graduation, I think. Unbelievable. And look, Kate, we'll, we'll finish off with a final question if, if we can. And look, there'll be thousands of people that are watching uh, this video today adore you. They'll be as inspired as you are. I've pretty well cried my way through this post. I'm sure other people are crying their way through this post going, this is the sort of human being I want to be. And you two embody the best of what a human could be. But Thank Kate, you. what would you say to all those incredible people in their 50s or 60s or 70s or 80s that are saying, you know, damn it, I'm not too old. I'm sick to death of people telling me this. I have something to say. This is my time. What would you, what advice would you offer to them? I'd say um, ring me if you want to talk, but also um, enrol with Tara. Tara, you're going to be flooded with oldies next year. So much so that, you know, who knows? But I, I don't feel 75. I don't know what 75 is supposed to feel like. Well said. Because I still have in my head, the back of my head, oh, I think I might enrol for another PhD. Obviously. <laughs> but uh, look, I've loved, I, I get excited with the thought of our team's meetings once a week, whereas in previous PhD lives, I used to be terrified. I used to be so anxious because I, people would shout at me or be downright rude or say, you have to do a systematic review. Well, I've done systematic reviews. I don't think they fit with my ideas of bedside care. And I'm still bedside. I'm a bedside nurse. That's what I am. And what you what you will be shortly is a bedside nurse with a PhD and incredibly well deserved. Right. Now, can you think of two better people to start your new year than being inspired by these two remarkable people? As I said, they've changed my life. I feel like a different human being after having supervised these two remarkable people. And in many ways, Kate is right. I've probably supervised more people. I think I've had about 180 PhD and research master's completions at this point, but probably about 60 of those students have been over the age of 70. And well, I have had the best time. They are the easiest students to supervise. We laugh our way through meetings and they move through to great success. So I thank Kate, I thank Eunice for putting blood and breath and bone back into my body, keeping me upright in this difficult year. And I hope they help you get up <clears throat> and moving forward in 2023. And on behalf of Kate, on behalf of Eunice and myself, Happy New Year, and we wish you love, light, and peace. Out. <laughs>